Good morning, saints. I listened to a sermon from a pastor addressing this text, and I think that he offered some very interesting insights. In fact, I like the main points that he made so much. I'd like to share those with you today. However, I wish he went a different direction, and so I may have taken the main points, but I've injected some of my crazy into it. So, in this text, we see the risen Christ challenging the lives of his, or changing the lives of his disciples forever. But, but this isn't a one-off thing. What we will see is this radical change which Christ has brought to his disciples, it wasn't just for them. This is for us as well. The risen Christ did not conquer our greatest foe. He did not endure our sin, drink the cup of God's wrath, and be raised from the dead so that our lives would not be radically transformed. What he did was to save us. To those who are in Christ, he saved us from an eternity that we rightfully earned. A hell that we deserve. He saved us from what we deserved, giving us grace, unmerited favor, that we would be adopted as sons and daughters. He saved us not only from an eternity that we deserved, but he saves us from ourselves here and now. Now what do I mean by that? We live in a world that it that has a serious identity crisis. We see it so clearly. People want meaning. They want to know who they are. What gives my life meaning? Why am I here? And what do we see? When people do not know their creator, the author of their lives, they grasp at anything to find their identity. People will place their entire identity into their sexual proclivity. People will place their identity in and try and change their biology, which is impossible, even mutilating their own bodies to try and conform to what they think they might be. We see people creating a fake life for themselves. They'll use their social media to create a life that they feel they want or that they deserve. And when their actual life doesn't match up, they will break up their families, abandon their marriage, and chase this fictional life, leaving a wake of destruction behind them. Our world has rejected Christ for a bundle of straws that all come up short. What we see here in this text is what we can see in our own lives as the risen Christ will transform us as well. First, Jesus answers the doubts of their minds. Now how does Christ do this? He challenges them. He argues with them. This is one of the truths that reflect a meaningful relationship. If we think about it, Now granted, it's already rare to have a true friend, which is sad in and of itself. But one of the qualities that define a true friend is that they will challenge you. They will call you out if need be. And Jesus frequently confronts the doubt of his disciples. He confronts their doubt head on, and he does so not because he's a big meanie. Here's why Christ confronts their doubts. There are several forms of doubt And they'll bring about different manifestations. There is the doubt in information. You hear something and you doubt the validity. This could be because you doubt the source. Maybe the source has proven themselves unreliable. Perhaps what you're hearing is unbelievable. A common phrase that responds to this is, I'll believe it when I see it. But we also see doubt manifest in different ways. We see various outcomes as a result of doubt. We see various outcomes in the sense that we see it play out in a paralyzing way. It will cause you to not step out or to not go for it. Or doubt will cause you to abandon the course or path that you are on altogether. Doubt can cause us to change the way we see someone. For example, in our lives things have happened. And when we see those things rise up again, we fear that it will happen again. For example, as you were growing up, if perhaps you found that your, one of your parents started working late, and then not long after that, they divorced, and now you find your spouse working late. And so because this happened when you were a child, you, you think it's going to happen again, and though your spouse has given you no reason to doubt them, because this has happened, it's caused you to doubt that this would be happening to you as well. 
It causes us to change the way we see someone. It causes us to doubt someone, even if they've given us no reason to doubt them. For all these reasons, we see why Christ would address the disciples' doubt. Christ addresses Thomas in John 20, beginning in 25, says, So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I, see, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so what does Jesus do? Verse 26, eight days later, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus flat out confronts Thomas. But this confrontation had a purpose. Jesus confronts the doubt. And why is that? Because the news was unbelievable. Yes, they saw Jesus resurrect Lazarus, but Jesus was alive and using tangible power. But how can a dead man raise himself? Doubt sets in. The news and even seeing the empty tomb, well, that's just too much. This doubt leads the disciples to doubting what Jesus had said, even who He is. They all went back to their old jobs. Many of them were fishermen. And this doubt caused them to completely forget what Jesus has said, who He is, and they abandoned the path they were on altogether until the resurrected Christ confronts them. Jesus himself suddenly stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were looking at a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why are doubts uh, arising in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you plainly see that I have. And when they had said this, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it, because of their joy and astonishment, he said to them, have you anything to eat? The resurrection is where our doubt needs to be addressed. Because in this we see the deity of the God-man. No man ever defeated death. Only God has the power over life and death. God raises the dead and no mere man can raise himself. The resurrection shows us that Jesus really was a man. He really died. And the resurrection reveals that He truly is God. If the resurrection did not happen, if Christ has not been raised, and Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15, for if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Think about this for a moment. If Christ has not been raised... What's our fallback? What's the next option? Well, if you believe that there is a higher power, then the only other option is a works-based pursuit to be accepted by God. If Christ is not raised, then there is no grace to be given. There is no salvation by grace through faith. The only other option is works. And I hope this may address some of the doubt in this room. Every single religion in the world, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and the list goes on and on and on. Every single religion is built upon works. You must perform. You must do. You must accomplish in order to be accepted by God or gods. All of them except one. Why would Christianity offer something different? Because when man creates a God, they create the God in their image. And that God will take on traits that are very humanistic. That God will reflect our own image, our own character, and the way that we go about relationships. Our relationships are built upon merit, performance, that we need to do in order to be accepted. And so these gods will reflect that as well. That's how our relationships work. And so that image is then imposed upon the deity that they have created. And that's just how we function. I did not marry Heather because I felt like she needed a place to stay and I was doing her a favor. It's messed up. That was quick. That was too loud. <laughs> she had to prove herself worthy as I had to prove myself worthy. 
But you know, that's not, how the Bible, that's not what the Bible teaches us about our relationship with God. The Bible says something that is so freeing, and that is we cannot earn God's acceptance. We cannot merit His grace. We cannot prove ourselves worthy of His love. Isaiah 64, 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all the righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our wrongdoings like the wind take us away. If our best is still filthy, then how on earth can we ever earn our way into God's presence? We can't. And that's the good news. And the resurrection affirms this. Now I'm leaving some of you on a cliffhanger here, but we're going to circle back to it. The second point, Jesus satisfies the needs of their hearts. Now, is Christ eating with them another proof of his physical resurrection? Yes. But that's not all that's happening here. I didn't know this, but I realized that a lot of people actually still function under this first century view of eating together. We see this image in Revelation 3, verse 20. It says, Behold, and this is Christ, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. To eat with someone was not just a meal. It was not just a kind gesture. To invite someone in for a meal was to extend your life, your friendship to the other person. Now, at the end of the year, Bill Britton asked us to get our budget together and propose it. And I remember that when I was doing youth ministry, the largest budget items were conferences, going out and doing stuff with the youth. But now as a lead pastor, it's meals. I have very few budget categories, but the largest by far is ministry meals. And the reason why is because I want to extend my life to you. I want to extend true friendship to you. And when we read the gospel and we go through the book of Acts, what do we see? We see all these meals taking place. And in that, what are we seeing? Relationships being established, being forged within the church. We're seeing lives being offered to one another. The food symbolically represents one's desire to know another person. And sharing in that meal was a way of saying, I accept. This is why Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners made the religious so mad. Jesus was accepting them. He was welcoming them into his life. He did this so that they would, by entering into this relationship, they would abandon their previous path and now follow him. That's why when Jesus would interact with these people, he would tell them, go and sin no more. But here is the danger. And if we would just be honest, we can admit that we've all done this. When we were younger, though this is stereotypically attributed to girls, but young boys do it. In fact, I know that I definitely did. When we were younger, we read a book or we watched a movie and we fell in love with this idea. This idea is that one day, there will be someone who will be the one who completes me. We thought, they will love me, they will accept me, they will build me up and make me a better person. Their presence in my life will fulfill the deepest longing of my soul, and so from that day forward, we went off in search of that person. Now, we may not have said this, but when we thought that we met that person, what did we say without saying it? We said, you will be the one who will complete me. You will be the one who will love me perfectly. You will bring meaning and purpose to my existence. Now we of course didn't say that because they would have run for the hills and who would have blamed them? <laughs> but without saying this, we still took this weight and we put it upon them and we all know what happened. What did we all come to find? We found that they could not live up to it, and that burden broke them. They were crushed under the longing of our expectations. The risen Christ asked his disciples for something to eat. And we'll go more into this in the next point, but Christ returns to the very men that abandoned him, that left him, and in one case, betrayed him. Christ returns to these men, and what does he do? He extends to them again his life. The question, have you anything to eat, is so much more than food. Jesus is saying, I still want you to know me. Christ is the one we have longed for. We cast the burden on other people to complete us. 
but no person can bear up under that burden. But Christ has. He can not only bear up under it, He placed that burden in longing in your heart so as to draw you to Him. To Him who can love you perfectly, who can share in your life perfectly, who can offer you grace. He put the longing there that you would be drawn to Him. But instead, we took that longing and we put it on someone else and we watched it crush them. But Christ put that in your heart that you would be drawn to Him, that you would find that in Him, He can bear up under the weight of your longing, your identity, your purpose, and your meaning. Third, Jesus reforges the direction of their lives. Now you might be aware of the disciples in the previous lives they had. Uh, It's interesting as you look, God took fishermen who were seen as hard workers but not very educated, and then those men went and went into the temple and debated all the religious leaders. Jesus took a tax collector and a zealot, Matthew and Simon, that without Christ, Simon would have killed Matthew without batting an eye, but now they are united in Christ as brothers. But this isn't the reforging I want us to really focus on. Yes, this is a radical transformation, but remember, when Christ died, the disciples were utterly lost. They had no clue what they were to do. They thought that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom on earth and overthrow Rome, but instead, Christ was murdered by Rome. Doubt caused them to abandon the path that they were on, and they went back to what they knew. This is another reason Jesus addresses their doubt because they stopped pressing on. They stopped forging forward in what Christ had called them to. They needed that fire lit again. But what's so interesting surrounding the resurrection is this. No one knows where Jesus' tomb is. Now people will say it, and tourists will go see a tomb, but nobody knows where Jesus' tomb is. There was a common practice in the early years that they would venerate a person's tomb. If there was a person of prominence, uh, they would make their tomb a place of remembrance. They did this even with false messiahs. When that false messiah would be killed or die, uh, the people would then come venerate the tomb and make it a place that people would come and worship. This practice of honoring someone's tomb was shared with Christians the first three centuries Now, though these tombs would not be places of worship, as with the pagans, they would remember where significant people were buried. Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, his tomb was venerated and remembered, but not Jesus. Are we to say that Polycarp or Hippolytus are more prominent than Christ? Well, first of all, how many of you ever heard of Polycarp or Hippolytus? So why not Christ's tomb? You see, when someone we love dies, there are items that become valuable. Their shirt, their chair, their shoes. They now hold value. Before they annoyed us, pick this up. Get this off the floor. Get this out of the way. What do you? And then when they're gone, they hold great value. What used to annoy us now is a mechanism of our remembering and taking joy in them. This should have been the case for Jesus' tomb, but... It wasn't. Why? It's because they had Jesus. A tomb is not valuable when he is risen. He is with them. He's eating with them. He's speaking with them. They have him. Who cares about a tomb when you have him? This would continue even as Christ ascended, that he would send the Holy Spirit to indwell the believer. Who needs a tomb when God now indwells us? Who needs a tomb when we are now his temple? Who cares about a tomb at this point? This is why no one remembers where Jesus' tomb is, because they have him. Because he has rose, because he has risen from the dead. Lastly, Jesus shows them his hands and his feet. This goes back to our first point with our doubts on the resurrection. Jesus shows his disciples the bodily wounds of the crucifixion. Now, these marks were unmistakable. You cannot fake holes in your hands and your feet. You cannot hide a wound in your side so big that he told Thomas, thrust your hand into my side. You cannot fake legitimate wounds like this. And he shows them. He says, see, 
These are real. I am here. And Jesus addresses their doubt and He reforges the direction back on their lives because of His resurrection. Because He has risen. That path that they abandon now becomes the only path worth walking. The resurrection calls us to a life of purpose because we know this life has meaning even in the midst of suffering. We recognize that it is only temporary. Johnny Erickson Tata, we've spoken about this remarkable woman several times. She was paralyzed at the age of 18 due to an accident, and she is a quadriplegic. She was at her church, and there was a time where her church was called to fall on their knees in prayer. Sitting in her chair, she broke down, and she realized, I will never be able to kneel again. But as she continued to sit there praying and meditating, she remembered the resurrection and what that means. It's not that Christ was raised, but that we too will be raised and he will restore everything. She said, I so look forward to heaven when I, finally, when I will finally rise on resurrected legs. And you know what the first thing I'm going to do? Drop down on grateful, glorified knees. I'll finally have the chance to kneel before my Savior. There was a Thursday at our discipleship group that Gracie felt the need to make us all cry. Gracie is a wonderful part of our family here at First Christian. She's blind, and one Thursday she brought us all to tears as she communicated this very same truth of the resurrection. She said, I don't care that I cannot see, but can you imagine how amazing it's going to be when Christ raises me and my eyes are open for the first time. And he in all his glory is the first person I see. The resurrection is so much more than just Jesus being raised. His resurrection shows us that he has the keys to life and death. He is God and he addresses our doubts. His tomb is empty. And he has invited us to know him. To be transformed by him. Saved by him. And raised again in him. If Christ has not been raised, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, for if the dead have not been raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all the people to be pitied most. If Christ has not been raised, then we have no hope at all. But this is not what history attests. The tomb is empty. The church is standing. God is moving because Christ has risen. And because he has risen, this is the good news. We cannot earn our way into God's kingdom. We cannot earn God's love. We cannot merit his salvation. Our best is filthy. Our best is not good enough. Our good is tainted and rotten at its root. And this is the good news. Seems a bit off. What's the good news? You just told me that I have no hope. We can have hope. And every single Christian in here will tell you where our hope is. Our hope is solely in Christ Jesus. He has knocked at the door. And he, for some of you right now, you are convicted of your sin. You know that you need to address this today. You know that you need to be made right with God today. Even as you sit here, that's the knock. Realize this. For some of you, as you sit here, you know that God is calling you to step out during this time of invitation and be reconciled to him. Understand what this means. He left eternity to become flesh, live a sinless life, die our sinner's death, conquer our grave, and he is convicting your heart right here and now. Look how far he has come just to meet you here. Look at all that he has done in his pursuit of you. And at this very second, Christ is reaching out to draw you in with one hand. There was a pastor, Paul Washer, who makes this incredible imagery where he tells us that with one hand, God, Christ is reaching out, offering us grace, offering us salvation, and then with the other hand, he's holding back the wrath of God. 
With one hand, he's saying, that debt you have accrued with your sin, I have paid it. Take my hand. Take that I have paid your debt. Receive my salvation. And with the other, he's holding back the righteous judgment that we deserve at this very moment. With one hand, he's saying, receive this. I want you in my family. I want you as my son. I want you as my daughter. Receive my salvation. And holding back what we are owed. But there's coming a day where the Bible says we don't know when, where there's going to be a day where both hands drop. Your sin is going to be paid for. It can either be paid for by Christ on that cross 2,000 years ago, or you can pay for it for all eternity. Because that's how long it's going to take to pay off. But at this very moment, the trumpet has not sound, and that hand is still reaching out for you that you would receive the grace of his salvation. And so during this time of invitation, I want to encourage you to reach out and take that hand. Whether it is the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter, to return and be reconciled to the father as he stood on the front porch looking off, waiting for his child to return. He actively was looking, but his son had to return. Is this your moment of taking that step forward out of the pig pen and back to the father that he would embrace you and welcome you back as a son and daughter? Or are you here today and you realize that you've never received Christ as your Savior? You've never even begun following him. You've never bent the knee to him. You've gone through this Christianity thing. Look, we live in East Tennessee. Everybody knows Jesus. But not everybody's following. To be a Christian is to be a follower of Christ. It is to follow what he has called us to do. That doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean that I don't fall short. It doesn't mean that, that, that we go through life without sin. In fact, John tells us anyone who says they are without sin, they're a liar. It's one of the easiest ways to identify a false teacher. If they say they haven't sinned, false teacher. We all fall short. That's what grace is all about. But that's what this this hand reaching out of salvation is all about. That it's grace. It's unmerited. It's you don't deserve this, but I'm giving you it. The image I I like to portray is, because the Bible says that we're adopted as sons and daughters. And the image I like to portray is, imagine a father going through all these steps to pay for uh, the the, the, the lawyer fees, to, to invest and put in the time to travel, to then go to an orphanage and see a child. And for that child to see that father, how silly would it be for that child to go, no, I don't want that father. After all that Christ has done to to buy us back, to to get us out of our sin. What child would turn away a father who's gone through such great lengths to adopt us? And so for some of you, this this is the day that you're being faced with this truth that you haven't been following him. You've been going through the motions. You can speak maybe fluent Christianese. You go to church once or twice a year. You use the name Jesus. But friends, there's a lot of Jesuses out there. Even in the first century, there were a lot of false Christs. There's a lot of gods that mankind has crafted with their own hands, in their own image, and named Jesus. But there's only one who bore your sins, rose from the grave, and is offering you salvation. And for some of you, Today's that day that you need to step out and take that hand. The day is coming where both of those hands will drop. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we get to remember the resurrection. The time that affirmed who Jesus is, that he truly is God. He was not some glorified man. He was not some angel. He was God in flesh. He bore our sins. He bore the wrath due us. And he rose from the grave. And because of him, we are offered an incredible gift of salvation. One that we do not earn and do not deserve in any way, shape, or form. But because of your love, a love that is nothing like we could ever fathom, you are offering it to broken and sinful human beings. That you 
that your completed work would make us perfect. That you would clothe us in your perfect righteousness. Not a righteousness that we earn, not a righteousness that we developed. It is yours and yours alone. And you are willing to give that to us because of your love and your grace. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has gotten off the path, as we read about the disciples, they abandoned the path and went back to what they knew. I pray that they would come forward, that you would reignite and reforge that path, that you would call them to what you've created them to do, that you will call them back to the journey you placed them on in the first place, that they would forge through and power through, that they would stay on path. Lord, if there's someone in here who doesn't know you at all, that they would be humble enough to recognize that, yes, I have proclaimed your name, but I have never been a true follower, that they would address that here and be reconciled to you. Father, we thank you for this remarkable mercy that you've given us, and we praise you for all that you've done, that you would adopt us as sons and daughters. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.